Hi everyone and welcome to the video. I'm excited to present this video to you. Um, as I mentioned to anyone who watched the podcast, I would be doing a much longer video today that's way more in depth and it's going to help you really to improve your game if you implement what I tell you in this video and you really pay attention and uh, take it in. Um, like I say in the thumbnail, this is for serious players only and the only reason I say that is because I only want the serious players to watch this. If you're a player who isn't really looking to improve, who isn't really looking to get to that next level or see themselves progress, this might not be the video for you. But if you are a player who is trying to improve, get better, and is actively trying to get better um, at soccer, improving themselves and everything like that, then this video is going to be perfect uh, for you. Don't let the length of this video scare you. Um, we're going over a lot of information. I do ask that you get a pen and paper out because I am going to be asking you some questions and you might want to take a few notes of things that stand out to you. Um, but essentially, we're going to be going over everything everything um, that makes a standout player. Now this is going to be part one of two simply because of how long these videos are. You can already see this video is like 30 minutes or so. So it is going to be part one of part two. Anyway, let's get right into it. I really hope you enjoy this video. I really hope that um, you learn a lot from it. Um, and let's go on to the uh, inside and uh, get started. All right, guys, welcome to how to be a standout soccer player. Very excited to present this to you guys. Now, a few things before we start. Make sure you have a pen or pencil and paper ready because I'm going to want you to write some things down. And this is for your benefit, not really mine. So make sure you have that pen and paper ready because there's going to be a few questions um, I'll have for you to answer. And also there might be some notes that you want to personally take. So make sure you have that ready. Um, next is if I'm ever going too fast during the video, feel free to pause or go back into the video at a certain point. Uh, I'm just going to try and go straight through this. So, um, you know, don't feel afraid to pause the video at any time. Um, and there are going to be certain points in the video that I'm going to suggest that you pause and I'll let you know when we get to those points, um, just because there's probably going to be something you need to write down. Okay. Next thing is if I repeat something, um, it's probably because subconsciously I'm giving it some emphasis um, and uh, or re-emphasizing something. So what that means is it's probably very important and you're probably going to want to take note of that. And final thing is, guys, this is part one of two. So um, because of the length that these videos are going to be, I don't want this to be like one 45 minute to an hour video. I want it to be cut up so that it's manageable but has all the necessary information that it needs. Okay, so let's move on to this first thing. So what will we be covering in these videos? Very important. So the first thing we're going to be covering is why you need to start having impacts or having an impact in matches. And what I mean by this is positive impact, not negative. I'm going to go over how you can do this. Next is how to be unpredictable. Another thing I go over very often, and that's just so important. And we're going to go over what areas you need to be good at, what need to be covered, what need improvement in order to become uh, that unpredictable player. We're going to go over physical attributes of a standout player, which just essentially means the standout areas of a standout player. So this will be like skills, attributes, physicality. We'll go over all that. And then the mental attributes of a standout player. And guys, this is so important, this, this mental attributes part. I mean, all of this is important if you want to be a standout player. But the mental attributes, players so often overlook this or ignore them. But they're so, so key to your success as a player or becoming a player that stands out. And ultimately, my goal is to have you become a player that is so good that they stand out consistently. Now... Remember, mental attributes, the mental side of the game is half the battle, if not more. And in my eyes, it actually is more than half the battle. It's just so important. Anyway, let's get on to the first area, which is having a positive impact in matches. Okay, so you must be that player that has positive impacts. Uh, impact on matches. I mean, I'm sure you've come away from games, whether it's just watching a friend of yours play, just having gone to a game, having to watching professionals in professional matches. You probably came away from each match, if you watch it all the way through, with a player in your mind who had the most positive impact on that match. It may have been the player that ran the show in the middle of the park. It may have been the player who scored the most goals. It may have been the goalie who made the most saves. 
Um, you know, but there's always that player that usually stands out for you. Sometimes there's a rare occasion when no one does and it's just a very dull game, um, or that there's so many impact players you can't choose one. But usually there's, you know, a couple or a handful of players that had a positive impact. So these are the players that score the goals. They create the chances. They dictate the play. Now, before I move on, this does not just include attacking players. You can be a standout defender. You can be a standout goalie. You can be a standout defensive player. Not all standout players score goals, create chances, or dictate the play. I mean, Andrea Pirlo uh, was... Did I even say his first name right there? I don't know. Pirlo was a very standout player in a defensive playmaker role, even when he just you know, played small passes. Xavi was a standout player a lot of the time so for Barcelona, probably very underrated. Uh, Conte is a very underrated um, standout player who does the dirty work, does good challenges, you know, is good from the defensive side. So this does not just apply to attacking players. I mean, you can look at goalkeepers who have had the most positive impact on matches and have been standout players. You can look at Tim Howard versus Belgium, for example, where he made like a record amount of saves and kept the United States in that match. So don't think this is just attacking players. If you're a defensive player, you can definitely have a positive impact as well. Now, for any position, it's incredibly important if you want to be someone who has a positive impact, you need to be a consistent performer. It's no good having a positive impact in some matches and then doing absolutely nothing in other matches. So, for example, you can't be a player that has a great game one week followed by four averages per average performances. I mean, what player do you think a coach is going to be more likely to play? The one really talented player that lacks consistency, so in five games they have one great game, but four pretty poor performances, right? Or how about the consistent player who in all five games doesn't have really like a hugely standout like man the match performance, but does their job, is solid, and is extremely consistent? Most coaches will include that can extremely consistent player in their team. And let me give you a very good real life example of this. Um, as a lot of you know, I'm a Liverpool fan. Our left back, our starting left back right now, who's been thriving in that position is James Milner. He's not even a left back by trade, but he's keeping out of the team Alberto Moreno, who is a young, um, not that he's 23, I think, but a young left back who is an actual left back by trade, by his specialty is left back. But James Milner, because of his consistency and, and his ability to have positive impact and his ability to do the job that's set for him, he's in the team ahead of um, Alberto Moreno. Because Moreno is a perfect example of this player who has one great game, but then four pretty average games. While James Milner is that player who is more consistent. He, he usually always has a solid game, and he even has some really good games amongst those. But it's very rare for him to have a bad game, even in a position he's not known for playing. So that's a good example. It's not always the most talented because I, I guarantee you um, Alberto Moreno is the more talented player as a left back, right? I don't think anyone can argue that. But James Milner is definitely the player who's done his research. He's put in the work. He is more consistent and therefore gets the nod. So that's a good example of not only hard work uh, paying off, but how being a consistent performer can get you in the team above supposedly more talented players. Um, and being a consistent performer obviously has a positive impact on the match. Next, you need to learn how to take risks and more importantly, how to make them pay off most of the time. So this is basically knowing how to balance yourself, knowing when you should be taking risks and when you shouldn't be. Um, all the best players in the world take risks and you can watch them if you don't believe me, you can look at highlight videos. You know, the best players in the world usually become the best players in the world because they're willing to take risks. And the really best players in the world are the ones who take risks and succeed most of the time when they take the risks. They're the players who take the risk of losing the ball and still take someone one-on-one -on -one and beat them. They're the ones who take the risk of shooting from however far out they are and, you know, either testing the keeper or scoring. You know, you have to be a risk taker sometimes. Now, now, let's, let's, let's make sure we ground ourselves here because, again, we mentioned that this is not just for attacking players. And, yes, as a defensive player, you're going to want to take less risks. Sometimes some positions call for you to take no risks, like center, defensive, mid, um, sometimes no risks. But you'll see players like um, Conte. You'll see players like Henderson, who's playing there now. You'll see players like Matic you know, still at times taking a risk here and there. They'll play like a long 40-yard ball and try and get... In the, let's say for Matic, he'll try and put Costa through with a 40-yard ball. 
That's a risky move because if it isn't pulled off, he gives away possession. Um, but it's learning what risks you can take in your position and which you cannot. So it's going to be different for a defender than an attacker, but there are, there are still different types of risks you can take, and you need to learn when and when not to take them. You know, a good one for a center back, for example, is maybe dribbling the ball out of the back. Think of a company or a John Stones or uh, a Matip who's been demonstrating this recently, or Hummels. Um, Every now and then in a game, they'll take the ball forward and set up the attack. I remember Matt Hummels, is it Matt's Hummels, did this so well against Liverpool in the Europa League, either semifinals, I think it was semifinals or quarterfinals, I don't remember, which was Villarreal. Um, but he took the ball forward from center back and played a perfect through ball to Marco Royce, who scored. That's a, that's a risk to take. He risks losing the ball. He's out of position, but he takes it and it pays off. They score a goal from it. And that's a positive impact right there if I've ever, ever, ever seen one. So just realize that even in certain positions, you can still take risks. Just understand which risks for which positions you can take, okay? But the impact players, the positive impact players are ones that know when to take the risks. Um, they don't shy away from taking the risks when the situation calls for it and so on. Next, whoops, that one didn't have an animation. Okay, so second thing for positive impact, um, you need to be an effective player. And what this means is all impact players are effective. And effectiveness is, you know, if you're effective at tackling, it means you win the ball most. If you're effective, effective at passing, you find your target most of the time. If you're an effective shooter, you put it on target and score a lot of the time, right? Um, and we need to differentiate this between being fancy. One of my favorite examples of this um, is Cristiano Ronaldo because you can see his evolution from an incredibly skillful fancy player to a still incredibly skillful but much more effective player. He basically became a goal scoring machine and it's unprecedented some of the amounts of goals he would score like 60 plus a season sometimes 50 plus maybe um, that's incredible right and he did that through becoming a more effective player and became you know one of the best players in the world through it but if you look at his early days at United he was incredibly, he was much more fancy. He did a little too much. He did a little, he took one player on too many sometimes. Um, and that's again, not calculating the risk, not knowing when to take it and when not to take it. He became, he actually became a little, it's hard to believe, but a little bit predictable in the sense of, okay, Ronaldo's going to dribble, right? He's just going to dribble. That is predictable. You don't know what move he might do, but you understand he's going to try and take everyone on. Um, he cut that from his game and started becoming more effective, using effective moves most of the time, making effective runs and passes and shots. Um, and that's a great example of a player who had a great transformation, had a great evolutionary process to get to being that incredibly effective player. Next is positive impact players work hard for their team. You cannot be a player with poor work ethic if you want to have a positive impact. You need good work ethic. Do not be lazy. Don't be lazy and leave your teammates out to dry. You'll have teammates on your back and your coach probably won't play you. It's that simple and you won't be able to stand out. I don't know many, too many standout players who are lazy. Um, one of my favorite examples of a player who could have been one of the best, really, um, and you may not agree with me, but Dimitar Berbatov, who played for United um, and Tottenham and uh, Fulham, I think, at one point. I think he came from Bayern Leverkusen. Um, but he was, oh, he was one of the most talented players I'd ever seen. He was an insane he was like, but he was like Zlatan Ibrahimovic in, in, the, in, the, in the realm of his technique was so good. This guy had such good ball control, such good, he had a great footballing brain. He, his technique was unbelievable. He had skill, um, but he was lazy. Admittedly, he was lazy. I think there was even a quote by him that said, you know, why do I need to do this if I can just do it like this or something? And you don't get in a Sir Alex Ferguson team. Um, if you're lazy, right? You know, Sir Alex Ferguson doesn't put up with that. And he, you know, got sold eventually because of it. And he wasn't starting matches. And it's, it's incredibly sad because he was a, I mean, I don't think he really, he's had a great career, but I feel like he could have been one of the best strikers in the world had he not done that. And he worked harder simply because he had everything. He had, he had everything. He literally is that player who had the world at his feet. He was so good. He was doing moves that, I remember one move he did and I was like, how, how did he do that? And it was on the byline or on the end line, and he just spun and flipped the ball over to the player's foot um, and then set up Ronaldo for a goal. You might even be able to remember this. And he was just an incredible player. But he didn't have the work ethic, and he didn't have the drive, and he would at times, you know, not close down. And that frustrated Sir Alex, who put harder working players above him, who were not as talented, right? So another good example of this from Liverpool 
is Daniel Sturridge. He's not getting in the team because his work ethic is questionable and it ruins Klopp's whole system. Now, no one is arguing his talent. Sturridge could be one of the most impactful standout players in the world on his day. But he needs to adjust his game to stop being so lazy and leaving his teammates out to dry because the reason Roberto Firmino plays ahead of Sturridge is because, I mean, even when Sturridge is in the side, Firmino's still in there. But the reason Firmino starts up top most of the time over Sturridge is because Firmino's willing to run. He is willing to harass defenders. He's much like Suarez in that way. He runs at them. He's perfect for Klopp's tactics of a uh, Gagan pressing or something to win the ball back. Where Sturridge doesn't always do that. He doesn't put in as much effort. And it can be learned, and I still have hope that he'll do it. But that's a good example of, again, a really talented player who could be one of the most positive impact players around, but isn't doing what he needs to do in order to do that. He thinks that just by being the skillful goal-scoring player, that that will be enough. But when you have a coach like Klopp and a coach that demands you work hard, it doesn't cut it. It doesn't matter how talented you are. So make sure you're working hard for your team. Don't be lazy. Have good work ethic. If you don't, start developing it. You know, take it a step at a time. Spent a lot of time on that one, so we're going to try and be a little quicker with these. So have a positive influence on teammates. Uh, and what this means is, you know, avoid negativity. You know, the amount of times through the ranks I've noticed other teammates being negative towards other teammates in the sense of like, oh, that was awful, you suck, you know, in just complete negative, not thinking, you know, negativity, um, just completely berating them, not in a constructive way either, in just a terrible way. I've seen coaches do this um, and disgust me because it's just a stupid, it's not a way, to, you don't do this. You know, there's, now there's a difference between constructive criticism, a player yelling at another player in order to motivate them and, or in order to make them aware of something, and a player who's just negative. So have a positive influence, don't avoid negativity, and know how to get the best out of your teammates. This is very important as well. Know what your teammates react well to. We're all individuals. We all react differently. Some of us need a cuddle. Some of us need a motivation. Some of us need someone just to kick us up the ass sometimes, right? We all work differently. Like I know teammates, we've had teammates who do better with someone yelling at them than they do with someone like giving, putting an arm around them. That's just how some are. Know how to get the best out of your teammates. Lead by example. Now, this is more of a leadership thing. Now, you don't need to be a leader to be a standout player, but it certainly doesn't hurt, right? You look at some of the great captains um, of the world. You look at, you know, some of the most impactful players um, are usually the captains. You know, you look at like Thierry Henry when he was in Arsenal and was the captain. I mean, look at Steven Gerrard when he was the captain. Uh, Zidane. Um, you know, these are some of the best players. Uh, and there's many more out there. You know, and, and again, all, the best player isn't always the captain, but usually they have some form of leadership. Usually they're avoiding this negativity. Usually they're trying to get the best out of their teammates, okay? So again, this is, a, this is kind of a little area that's a part of this. Um, I know this is not something every player has. Um, it's just something to keep in mind. Now, next is good to great decision making. You need to be making good decisions the majority of the time. Um, you just can't get around it. Um, and one of the ways or one of the reasons players make poor decisions is because they panic. They lack composure. Um, for example, um, if you've ever being about to receive the ball with your back towards goal and you heard someone closing you down um, and you got nervous and you took a bad touch. That's because you panicked in that situation. You panicked, you thought, oh no, what happens if I lose the ball? You know, my teammates, you know, you, all this whole stream of thought just made you panic, right? But the fact of the matter is you are perfectly capable of trapping the ball, maybe shielding it or turning away from that defender because in practice you've probably done it hundreds of times. So what's the difference? You weren't panicking then, you're panicking now. So you need to learn how to deal with those pressure situations and not panic. You need to learn how to become composed um, in those situations. Because if you have the ability, you have the ability. I know many of you tell me you, you do well in practices, but not so well in games. That's all down to this mental um, thing. It's all down to nervousness and pressure and feeling the pressure. Um, so if you can learn to start dealing with that pressure, to stop, start being more calm and composed in these situations. You won't panic, and you'll be able to make the good decisions, right? And we'll cover this more, uh, we'll definitely cover this more in the mental um, attribute section of the next video, which is part two, okay? So just remember, though, that positive impact players make good to great decisions most of the time. They're pretty consistent with good decision making. Positive impact questions. 
So time to get out your pen and paper um, and uh, answer these questions. And I'm going to ask you them and then you can pause the video, uh, answer them, and we'll move on. So the first one is, are you currently a player who has a positive impact in matches? So go back and look at everything. Take a look at everything we've gone over and is that you? Are you someone who the majority of the time in matches make as a positive impact the majority of the time or not? Just be completely honest with yourself. It's very important you're honest with yourself here or else you're not going to really learn anything. So make sure you're brutally honest. If your answer is, oh my God, no, I never have an impact. As long as that's, you're being honest with yourself, that's fine because we're going to work on making sure you get better. Okay, so take a, uh, take a moment to answer that, pause the video, and we'll move on. And also a part of that question is, are you consistent? So make sure you put that in there. So next is what areas are you strongest in from this topic, so this area? So again, go back, take a look. What are you strongest in? List your strengths. Now, you don't need to write why yet. Just go back, list everything from this that you're good at, um, that you believe you're good at. Again, be completely honest with yourself. Same thing, go back and take a look. What are you weakest in? What are your glaring weaknesses in this area? Um, what areas are you having a negative impact in? What areas are you not having so much of a positive impact in? Maybe even what areas you're just not really that, you're just pretty average in. List those now, pause the video if you need to. Next, what are you going to do in order to improve your weaknesses and enhance your strengths. So this is the important part. We've made you aware of what you're good at, what you're not good at. Now it's time to actually figure out what you're going to do about it, right? So what and how are you going to improve these areas? So make a mini game plan. Now when all these videos are done, at the end of the part two, we're going to make a much bigger game plan so that you have something you can implement after these lessons, but I want you to make like a miniature game plan, kind of like an outline of a game plan right now. So what are you going to do? You could write down just certain drills you might try, you know, I'm going to practice this a certain amount every day, whatever it may be, um, make a mini game plan right now. And you can pause the video. Okay, so now I want you to write down, obviously, all your answers on pen and paper, or you can make a notebook for this. But I also, also want you to put them in the comments down below. This is very important, guys. I know a, a lot of you may not do this, um, but if you write down your answers down there, I can help you even more. Other players can come in and trade notes with you, so to speak. You know, we have a community here of players who are, you know, want to improve, and it's always good to have uh, you know, feedback from other players like yourself who can help you with problems you're having. Um, and I'll be in the comments as well to help you as well. Um, so please put your, your answers to these questions from your notebook also in the comments, and I will be trying to answer as many as I can, and feel free to help each other out as well. Okay, so that's that. If you need to pause before we move on, go ahead and do that. Um, but we're moving on to being unpredictable. So this is the second part. And this is one I love to go over because it's one thing I don't see enough of. So being unpredictable includes being good at many different areas of the game. So having many qualities, like, you know, being a pretty good player all around. So, you know, an example of this is being a player who's not only good at taking people one-on-one, -on -one, but you're, you have a great shot. You have great passing. You know, you, you read the game well. You're not just good at one thing. Next is know when and when not to take risks. We already went over this. You have to have a balance in this area. If you lack a balance in this area, then you're going to be making poor decisions. This comes back to good decision making. Um, and good people who make good decisions take risks when, they, when there's an opportunity to do so and it's going to benefit your team. Um, but they also know when the risk really isn't worth it and they don't do anything. An example of this is trying to beat someone one-on-one -on -one in your defensive third with like two defenders behind that defender. There's no real win-win here. Even if you beat the defender, you're most likely to lose the ball. Next, um, being unpredictable, they are not one-dimensional players. One-dimensional is the exact opposite of being unpredictable. It's being predictable. It's only being good at one area. We're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again in matches. Now again, um, in training, you want to be doing that for repetition purposes, to learn moves. 
But in matches, if you do the same thing over and over again, guess what the defender's going to think you're going to do next? That exact thing, they can anticipate it and uh, kind of shut you down. So they don't always do the same thing over and over again. Now, that, doesn't, that does not mean you won't do something often. For example, you'll probably be playing one and two touch for much of the match, but you have the ability to change it up at, you know, like uh, at any point. Next. Um, and also, you are hard to read, which is kind of self-explanatory there. So, being unpredictable part two, we're, we're kind of blown by this one a little more. Um, but they have a wide array of moves. I don't even know if that's spelled right, but we're going to pretend it is. So they have a wide array of moves. Um, I recommend you have three skill moves that you have mastered. Not are adequate at, not are proficient, not even proficient at, like you've mastered. Like if you did these moves 99 or 100 times, you'd get it perfect 99 times out of 100, right? I want you to master three moves. And mastering three moves is better than being okay at seven or proficient at seven, right? Now, make sure these are effective moves. Don't be like saying, okay, I've got my three moves. It's the, it's the, uh, the Neymar chop, the, the rainbow, and, you know, the quadruple step over. Yes, I've got them. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Pick three effective moves. Here are mine. I, I do the step over, the body feint, and the Cruyff. Now, of course, I have more moves in my repertoire than that, but those are the three moves I decide to master first. Then I can move on and practice other moves. For example, I do the Maradona a lot. I do the Chop a lot. I do the Stanley Matthews a lot. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll combine moves if I need it. But I have those three moves to call upon at any time. And I know that I'm going to do them correctly 99 out of 100 times. And you don't understand how much of a weapon that is. So make sure you have three moves you've mastered. Next, um, unpredictable players can be very direct when the situation calls for it. Now, in my last video, we actually talked about being direct and how this can be really good. So you can take a look at that after this if you want a little more information on that. Um, but when the situation calls for it, they're very direct. So on the counterattack, they're very direct. They don't slow the play down because that you know, just counterproductive, isn't it? You know, they get the ball in the wing and they have a defender isolated. They take them on right away. They go right towards goal. Um, you know, so many of the best players in the world are direct. And I mentioned this in that other video. Players like Messi and Ronaldo and Suarez and Bale and Hazard. You know, they know when to be direct and they can be. And it's, you know, it's incredibly dangerous for the defense. Um, so they take their chances. They know when they need to be direct. And this goes back to knowing when and when you shouldn't take risks. But they take those chances when they should. And they also make defenders sweat by doing this. Defenders do not like it when you run right at them. Because only a few things can happen. One, they can dive in um, and potentially get the ball. But they might foul you or get beaten. Or two, they can try and you know sh contain you. But they're going to give up space and ground by doing that. Um, so it's not, you see, if you stay still, the defender, you're in the defender's court at that point because there's only so much you can do. Um, you know, the defender basically can now take some time to kind of have a game plan against you and he can also wait for help and reinforcements. So being direct is a great thing to do when you can. Next, um, they don't overdo it. Now it's important that we balance this out. They, they're not always direct. They're not always taking risks. They're not always doing one thing. That's the thing, really. They're not being predictable. They don't overdo it. So they'd have balance. It's so important to have balance. Okay? They put in the work behind the scenes. This is a little different than everything else I've been saying. But don't think that players who uh, come out and are able to do all these things don't put in the individual effort behind the scenes. You know, Messi didn't just become Messi through doing only the Barcelona practices. Same with Ronaldo. I mean, Ronaldo's famous for, like, practicing individually every single day outside of his normal training. So realize that these players who can do these unpredictable things can because they put in the work. There's no getting around that, okay? They, they put in the work behind the scenes. And again, typically they're hard workers and trainers. Okay, so let's get into the being unpredictable questions. Now, the questions are so important, guys, so make sure you're answering them. So this time, on a scale of 1 to, de or one to 10, I've been speaking a while here, how unpredictable do you think you are? So take a second, think about it, really think about it. Um, are you a 5? Are you pretty average? Are you pretty good at a 7 but need some improvement? Are you incredible? Are you a 9? Um, or are you, do you need, are you a 2? Do you need some work? So... Pause the video, just think for a second, and give that question an answer. 
Next, um, and probably more importantly, why do you think you're that number? Literally list the reasons why you think that. If you're a two, tell me why you think you're a two. Are you not able to beat people? Are you, you one-dimensional? Are you not um, doing the things you need to do? And if you're an eight, why are you an eight? Are you, do, are you unpredictable? Are you directed when you need to be? Do you make good decisions and so on? So tell me why you're the number you just wrote down and make sure you pause. Okay, good. Now I want you to write down a time when you were unpredictable and it paid off. So this could be you ran right at a, at a defender uh, and beat them. And let's let's talk matches. Um, so not practices, but matches, because that's the more risky t- risky time to be unpredictable. Um, so write down a time you were unpredictable and it worked and it paid off. And tell me what happened. So it ended up in a goal and a great goal scoring opportunity. You know, was there a benefit to the risk? So go ahead and pause the video and answer that real quick. Okay, next, of course, is what are you going to do now to improve this area? Um, This is the important thing. This is, again, your mini game plan. What are you planning on doing to become more unpredictable? Are you going to start watching more unpredictable players? Are you going to work on mastering those three skill moves? You know, look back and start making a little game plan. And again, we're going to combine all these game plans at the end, but I want you to make a little game plan for each area so we can make a big game plan after part two um, with all of the areas. So take a moment to give yourself a little mini plan. Okay, and again, write down your answers and make sure you're putting them down in the comments. Now this is very important, guys, that you put it in the comments because what if you have an a way you're going to improve this area that another player didn't think of. Now they can use your way as well, and vice versa. So it's very important that you're you're sharing notes. You're going to learn a lot from each other, Um, not just from me. You know, there are a lot of um, smart players who watch these videos. So take the time to also put these in the comments, and you can, you know, interact with each other down there, help each other out, and, you know, see what other players are doing. And again, I will be checking the comments as well to give some tips, some advice, you know, um, and to also... Um, and or to respond to your answers to these questions. All right, guys, so let's go over really quickly, and this is the last thing, is how you can initially improve some of these areas. So we're going to do this quickly. I want you to start watching players that fit the description of the stuff I've been going over, so players who have positive impacts and who are unpredictable. So usually go for the best of the best, go right to the top. You don't want to be learning from the average. You want to be learning from the best because you're not only going to learn the skills they're good at and everything, but you're going to see how they carry themselves, you know, how they react to things and things like that. Um, So again, analyze everything they do. Those best of the best players. Analyze what Messi does. Analyze what Ronaldo does. Analyze what Bale does. Blah, blah, blah. All of them, you know, any good player or the best players. Now figure out why they do certain things. So this is the important thing when you're watching matches. Why did they do that? Did they do that to create space? Did they do that to wait for their teammates to catch up? You know, figure out why they do certain things and that's gonna help your soccer IQ as well. And also notice how they react to certain things. How do they react to mistakes? How do they react to successes? How do they react to wins and losses? Things of that nature. Next is you need to be very aware of yourself. So what this means is realize what you're good at. And some of the questions that you answered in this video is going to allow you to start realizing what you're good at and what you're not so good at, which is the next one, what needs improvement. And that's one of the important reasons why I want you writing the answers to these questions because it's going to bring awareness to what you're good at, what you need work on, and so on. Now, also important is to be very honest with yourself. Do not bullshit yourself. Do not be like, you know, I'm actually pretty good at this when you're not. You need to be honest with yourself, okay? Um, if you do one good thing in a certain area, but but it's only one time out of ten and the other nine times you don't do it so well, you have to be honest with yourself and don't have tunnel vision. Don't, have select, don't be selective with your information. Use all the information. Don't have selective um, feedback either. Um, so if, for example, you do a step over and you did it well in a game, but not, but only one time out of 10 probably means you need improvement in that area. Sorry about that. Okay. Also going over your physical areas you're good at and your mental. And we'll go more into these areas in the next, in part two, we'll go over like the physical attributes and the mental attributes. So don't worry too much about that now, but just 
Keep in mind, are you fit? Are you out of shape? Are, are you someone who's struggling physically? Are you struggling mentally? You know, what are your thoughts? Are you a positive person or a negative person? Become aware of these things. And it's, it's not a bad thing to admit these things because the first step in improvement or changing something is admitting what, where you are right now. If you want to get to where you want to go, you need to know where you are now. Next, review your own matches and practices. A few ways to do this. If you can film them, have someone film them for you, that's perfect because you can re-watch it, um, but that's not necessary. Um, if not, just go over practices and matches in your head afterwards. I recommend the night after or the same night so it's fresh in your mind. Um, and then make sure you are taking note of what you did well and not so well and putting it in a journal. Now, this is great if you don't can't film your matches and you're keeping a journal because then you can just go into your journal, write what you did well and not so well, what you want to improve, practices you might need to do, um, and you'll start to see... Um, Hold on. You'll start to see trends, and this is important. So you'll start to notice, mm, you know what, my position in, in these last three games hasn't been good in my positional sense. I need to start working on that. Or you'll see, hmm, I lost the ball in a dangerous position there. I need to start working on that. You know, again, this, this plays into awareness. You need to be aware of your, of your strengths and weaknesses, and a great way to become aware of it is to um, journal everything, all your games, all your practices, then you can review it and see what the trends are. You'll also take note of what you're good at and things of that, so you'll start to notice where you need to improve. You'll also start to notice your progress, which is a very fun thing. Um, whenever I've done this, like if I want to improve a certain area, if I look at day one to like day 30 or something, I'll be like, wow, this, this has improved drastically over that time um, because I identified it as something that needs improvement. So keeping a journal is really important. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end here, you know, I commend you. That means you are pretty dedicated towards becoming a better player and you're committed towards improvement. And seriously, you should give yourself a pat on the back. That does mean a lot. Now, it's important that you now implement what we've gone over. Um, like I had you do in the PowerPoint, I told you to make mini game plans of the areas you went, we went over. In part two, we're gonna do the same thing. And at the end, we're gonna bring it all together so that you have a solid game plan moving forward to improve these areas and become that standout player that I so desperately want Want you to become and I hope that you so desperately want to become as well. So this is the first step, watching this video, taking the notes, bringing about the awareness of what areas you need to improve on and what areas standout players excel in. So guys, thank you so much for watching. Please hit the like and share button. It did take me a while to create this. Um, we're not even done. We have a part two coming up. Um, I will put a thumbnail for part two somewhere down here, but that won't be available to click on until obviously part two is created, which will be next week. And I want to keep at least a week between the videos so you have enough time to implement and kind of take in the information from this video. If you're new to Simply Soccer, you know, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Uh, we're going to be releasing at least four videos a week, including one long video like this every week if I can. Um, so far, I don't see why I can't. So expect a very in-depth video like this every single week or every other week. We'll see what we can keep up with. Once again, guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, thank you to all of you who made it to the end here. Make sure you answer those questions and you put them down below. That's so important. Um, Make sure at the very least you're answering them in your own journal or on paper, but I would very much like you to also answer them down in the comments so that other players can give you tips, advice, that I can see your responses and I can come in the comments as well and help some of you guys out, maybe answer some of your questions um, or maybe even help you get through something that you're stuck on. All right, guys, once again, thank you for watching and I'll see you in part two next week.